Happy Sabbath. Happy Sabbath. Yes. Um, the Sabbath is a wonderful time where we can come and fellowship and most importantly hear the word of God. You know, um, as I was preparing uh, for this, and even this week, um, events have taken place um, in my life and things around me that have really stressed and emphasized in my mind how close we are to the end of time. Mm -hmm. The fact that God is seeking to awaken us as seven-day Adventists so that we can do the work that God has called for us to do. Mm -hmm. uh, this is the reason why God brought us into existence. Amen. Though there are very few people here, I pray that we not be discouraged by this. You see, the Bible says that whenever there are two or three that are gathered in the name of Jesus, that God's presence is literally in the midst of it. Amen. You know, because God is not really looking for numbers, and, and, and especially in this last time of earth's history, God is looking for consecrated people who are serious about the work of salvation. Amen. This is one of the greatest burdens on the heart of Christ right now, and the reason why Jesus has not been able to come back is because of this great lack. And so by the grace of God, the Lord wants us to be a part of this special group that God is preparing for the end of time in which we are living right now. But before we delve into our message, let us have another word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we come before you humbly, truly praying for the forgiveness of our sins, and that you will cleanse us from the filth and the stench of unrighteousness. Dear Lord, you're seeking to rid not only this world, but the entire universe of the plague of sin. Dear Lord, I pray that your Holy Spirit may tabernacle with us. Please open and expand our minds as we study your word, so that we may have the revival and reformation, not only for ourselves, but for our, for our families. Dear Lord, for this church and for this area. And I pray that you would keep us to this end in Christ's name. Amen. 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 You know that we're told that the greatest and most urgent of all of our needs is a revival and a reformation. You know, we need to be awakened unto God every single day. You know, because the Bible doesn't teach that once converted, always converted. You know, because we don't believe that if, if, if you give your life to Christ once, then that's it. You know, the Bible does not teach once saved, always saved. Neither does it teach once converted, always converted. Mm. Do you know that prayer that, that, that David prayed in Psalm 51, as far as creating me a clean heart, O oh God, and renew a right spirit in me, this is a prayer that we literally have to pray every single day of the week. We are not safe one moment without communion and connection with God. Not a single moment. And so, brothers and sisters, we're going to, this weekend and next weekend, we're going to study some very serious subjects. Very serious subjects. And those of you of us here, I pray that we can invite some persons to come and hear the Word of God. Now, what we're going to get into uh, tonight is uh, something here, and I want us to pay attention to our, to our screen. Now, what can you see here? This is a picture of a young boy. Now, I don't know if we can discern what he is sleeping next to, but this is actually a holy Bible that he's sleeping next to. The state of this dear young boy is actually the condition of our church today. It is the condition of each and every one of us, because, you know, we as individuals make up the church. We have to ask our questions, are we sleeping? Is this church sleeping? This is the question that we have to ask, and it has to be answered. Now, let's open up our Bibles to the book of 1 Corinthians. Let's open up our Bibles to the book of 1 Corinthians. And we're going to notice why Jesus equates us to this sleeping child. 1 Corinthians chapter 3, we're going to start in verse 2. We're actually going to start in verse 1. It says, And I, brethren, could not speak unto you as unto spiritual, but as unto carnal, even as unto babes in Christ. So Jesus, through the inspiration of the Apostle Paul, Holy Spirit, is saying that we are likened unto babes for a particular reason. Now notice the Bible. Verse 2 it says, I have fed you with milk, and not with meat, for hitherto ye were not able to do what? To bear it, neither yet now are ye able, for ye are yet carnal, for, I, for whereas there is among you envying. 
You know, this sin of envy has crept in to the church and into families. It says, and strife and divisions are ye not carnal and walk as men. So God is saying, as a result of these grievous sins that we are cherishing in our individual lives and collectively, God is liking us to, the, to this sleeping child. Now, when someone is sleeping, the Bible does not say that that is a very good condition to be in. Let's turn to the book of Romans. Let's turn to Romans. Let's turn to Romans. Romans chapter 13 in verse 11. Romans chapter 13 in verse 11. Romans chapter 13 in verse 11. The Bible says, And that knowing the time, that now it is high time to awake out of sleep, for now is our salvation nearer than when we believe. So what this is saying is that when someone is sleeping, they do not realize the nearness of salvation. What this is saying is that when someone is sleeping, they are not in a condition of being saved. Now the reality is, is that you don't just have to be a whirling to be sleeping. There are very many of us in the church who are dead asleep. Now notice what the prophet of God says. This is a symbol of something called juvenile religion. We are at another place and we are explaining that this type of baby religion is what most of us are practicing. Now, the Bible makes it very clear that we cannot be saved in this condition. This says, this is from Testimonies, Volume 2. It says, a listless, unfeeling manner of presenting the truth will never arouse men and women from their death-like slumber. So what God is saying is that as a result of the messages of God being presented tamely, this is not going to awaken men and women. Now, notice... It doesn't say slumber alone, it says death-like slumber. Now, it's one thing to be sleeping, but, the, but in this condition, we're not just sleeping, but we are dead sleep. Notice. They must show by their manners, speaking of the pastors, by their acts and words, and by their preaching and praying, that they believe that Christ is at the door. Now, how many of us believe that Jesus is really about to come back? Amen. Men and women are in the last hours of probation and yet are careless and what? And stupid. Now imagine this. Imagine that the God of the universe literally looks at every single one of us and says that we are stupid. Now do you think that that's something nice to say? It's not. But think that the God of the who died for our sins looks at us and says that we're stupid. You know that the only thing that stupid means is that it, it signifies that you lack intelligence and common sense. I mean, think about it. We are at the very end of time, and we do not manifest the earnestness that we need to be manifesting. That's stupid. It says, and ministers have no power to arouse them. They are asleep themselves. So it's not just the congregation, but our pastors are sleeping. It says, sleeping preachers preaching to a what? To a sleeping people. Brothers and sisters, we need to get down on our knees and we need to pray, Lord, please awaken me out of my death-like slumber. Please. So this is a juvenile religion. Now going on, this is a symbol also as well as what we're doing sadly as God's people. Now this is a symbol of one of the most tenderest acts that a mother can do for a child. This dear woman, she's breastfeeding her child. Now, is it a wrong thing to be breastfed? Mm -mm. No. Now, would you think it's strange if you saw a little baby who was two years old being breastfed? Would that be strange or, or weird? No, of course not. But if you saw a 30-year-old grown man still sucking on his mother's breast, do you think that that would be strange? That would be very strange. Now, sadly, we as God's people should be grown individuals in Christ Jesus but we are still upon breast milk. Still upon breast milk. Let's turn in our Bible to the book of Ezekiel. Let's turn to Ezekiel, Isaiah rather. Let's turn to Isaiah. Isaiah chapter 28. Isaiah chapter 28. And we want to bring out, bring out a biblical principle because we're about to read from the word of God that God wants to teach us. But in order for us to be taught, we have to be weaned from this condition. Isaiah chapter 28. 
Starting in verse 9, the Bible says, Whom shall he teach knowledge, and whom shall he make to understand doctrine? Them that are weaned from the milk, and drawn from the breast. For precept must be upon precept, precept upon precept, line upon line, line upon line, here a little, and there a little. It says, For with stammering lips and another tongue will he speak to his people. Now notice verse 12. To whom he said, This is the rest wherewith he may cause the river to rest, and this is the refreshing, yet they will not hear. So God is saying, and especially in, in, as it pertains to these last days, if we are going to receive the refreshing from the presence of the Lord, we need to be weaned off of breast milk spiritually. Notice what the prophet says. It is too late in the day to feed with milk. It's too late for that. If souls a month or two old in the truth who are about to enter the time of trouble, such as we don't understand. We literally do not understand what is about to break upon this world. The crisis over the seal of God and the mark of the beast is literally about to break, and we have no just conception of this. We're not living as if these things are literally about to take place. It says, cannot hear all the straight truth or endure the strong meat of the straightness of the way. How will they stand in the day of battle? Brothers and sisters, how many of us here want to win souls to Christ? Amen. By, by God's grace, all of us are missionaries for the Lord. Amen. So what God is saying is that those that we bring into the church need to understand what they're about to get themselves into. Amen. It's serious. It says, truths that we have been years learning must be learned, not in a few years, but in a few months by those who now embrace the third angel's message. There is so much evangelism that has to be done in the world, but we ourselves must understand what we have to be teaching those new converts that come in amongst us. And so God is clearly showing us this. Now, what we're going to do, we are going to delve in to some of the things that Satan is using in order to distract us as God's people. Notice this. I don't know if we can discern what this is a symbol of, but this is a symbol of something called social engineering. You see, the social aspect of us as human beings is a powerful medium. You see, the greatest social institution that God created was marriage and the family. Satan has successfully broken down the social aspects of us as human beings, and as a result of this, when this crisis breaks, Satan is so manipulating things that when it does break, everyone will literally be thinking just like the devil. Notice this. You see, what this is, this is a symbol of what is going on in the world today. This is a puppet master that is manipulating a man, and in uh, his left hand is left, and in the right is right. You see, the whole idea of left and right, you know, we have it in politics, you know, we have it in the church, we have liberals and conservatives. You see, all of this are, all of these things are just literally inventions of Satan to, to distract us from the truth, but they're not real. And there's also a compass and a set square there on the floor, which is a symbol of Freemason. Now, notice, notice this. I don't know if we can see this cage, but in the cage is the word freedom. You see, we live in a day and time where freedom is literally being caged. It's literally being caged. Let's turn our Bibles to the book of, we're still in Isaiah. Let's go to Isaiah chapter 60. Uh, Isaiah, yes, Isaiah chapter 60. Isaiah chapter 60. Actually, we're, uh, Isaiah chapter 59, rather. Isaiah chapter 59, we're going to start in verse 14. Now, notice what the Bible says. Isaiah chapter uh, 59, starting in verse 14, the Bible says, And judgment is turned away backward, and justice standeth afar off, for truth is fallen in the streets, and equity cannot enter. 
So what God is saying, and even what this is saying, is that sadly, the principles of truth and righteousness are literally being caged and blockaded. And in order for freedom to be let loose, God needs his people to proclaim the last message of mercy to the world. Notice this. Does anybody know who this particular woman is right here? This is a woman by the name of Marilyn Ferguson. This woman was an occult uh, an occultist, and she was also a New Age a writer. Now notice what this dear woman said. She said, this is taken from a book called The Aquarian Conspiracy. Follow me. A leaderless but powerful network is working to bring about radical changes in the United States. Now this book was written in the 1980s. What this woman, now this woman was not a Christian, but what she was saying that there was something taking place within the United States in order to destroy the social fabric of this nation. Its members have broken with certain key elements of Western thought, and they have even have broken a continuity with history. This benign conspiracy for a new human agenda has triggered the most rapid cultural realignment in history. So these things, and you know it's amazing, because everything the United States does, every nation around the world follows suit. Every nation. So if the United States wants to start listening to rap music, guess what every other nation does? If the United States wants to get bankrupted and go into uh, massive amounts of debt, guess what, what the rest of the world does? It does the same exact thing. Notice this. Anybody know who this man is? This is a man by the name of Edward Bernays. He wrote a book called Propaganda, and what this man literally did, he would literally teach governments how to manipulate their people within their nation. Notice what this man said. He said the conscience and intelligent manipulation of the organized habits and opinions of the masses is an important element in democratic society. So what he's saying is that in order for a nation to run properly, the people of that nation need to be intelligently manipulated. You see, when we turn on our television and we're watching entertainment and sports and the news, we're literally being intentionally manipulated. Intentionally manipulated. It says those who manipulate this unseen mechanism of society constitute an invisible government. What we're about to find out is that this government is not invisible. The Bible clearly identifies what power is behind the scenes that is manipulating the masses. It says, which is the true ruling power of our country? We are governed, our minds are molded, our tastes form, our ideas suggested largely by men we have never heard of. This is the logical result of the way in which our democratic society is organized. Vast numbers of human beings must cooperate in this manner if they are to live together as smoothly functioning society. So what this is saying is that if this unseen mechanism does not intentionally manipulate people, then society cannot function properly. Now, does the Bible say that, that God is trying to manipulate us? Does the Bible teach that? What does God say in the book of Isaiah? He says, come, let us together. God is not trying to manipulate us. He wants us to make the intelligent decision to choose to serve him. But that's not how Satan functions. Satan tries to control us by fear or by force. You see what this is? This is the true ruling power in our country. Can everybody see what this is a picture of? This is a picture of the Vatican. Now sadly, brothers and sisters, we, we, we are no longer doing what we are called. You see, as Seventh-day Adventists, we are considered Protestants. But sadly, we are no longer protesting. Some of us are even saying that the protest is over, but is the protest over? No, the protest is to be continued all the way to the end of time. Does anybody know who this man is right here? Um, this is a man by the name of Henry Kissinger. He used to be the Secretary of State under Richard Nixon. Now, notice what this man said. Now, this man, again, is not a Christian, but notice what he says. Please follow me. Religious unity had fractured with the survival and spread of Protestantism. The Protestant Reformation destroyed the concept of a world order sustained by the two swords of papacy and empire. So what they're saying is that 
There was a desire during the Dark Ages to have a complete world order that would be governed by the papacy. But by God's grace, the Lord raised up the Protestant Reformation. Amen. <laughs> notice what this goes on to say. This man is a man by the name of Malachi Martin. Now notice what he says. Now this is taken from a book called Keys of This Blood. Now we're going to jump down to the very, uh, to the very bottom. Actually, let's just read this whole thing. It's so powerful. It says, what captures the unwavering attention of secular leaders of the world is this remarkable network of the Roman Catholic Church. It's precisely the fact that it places at the personal disposal of the Pope a supranational, supercontinental, super trade block structure that is so built and orientated that if tomorrow or next week, by a sudden miracle, a one world government were established, the church would not have to undergo any essential structural change in order to retain, number one, its dominant position, and number two, to further its global aims. Lastly, it says, at his most specific, however, he insists that men have no reliable hope of creating a viable geopolitical system unless it is on the basis of Roman Catholic Christianity. So what this is saying, this man, now this man was a Roman Catholic, and what he was saying is that politicians have, have literally, they have no ability to have a one world government unless it is on the basis of Roman Catholic Christianity. So what this is saying is that it is the papacy that is ruling the world. Now this is not some conspiracy theory, this is literally what the Bible tells us what happened now. And what we're going to do tomorrow, by God's grace, we're going to go step by step as to what is taking place in our world and what our position is to be as Seventh-day Adventists in relation to this. Now this is taken from the book, Great Controversy. Now who here has read the book, Great Controversy? Amen. Notice it says, the Roman church is far-reaching in her plans and modes of operation. She is employing every device to extend her influence and to increase her power in preparation for a fierce and determined conflict. Notice, to regain control of the world, to re-establish persecution, and to undo all that Protestantism has done. So what God is saying is that the papacy literally wants to regain control of the entire world and to re-establish Persecution. You know, we really have to ask ourselves, do we love Christ so much that we would be willing to die for him? And not just die for him peacefully, you know, dying of old age and, you know, you know being, you know, content and at rest, but to literally be tortured, to have our life withering away in a dungeon, and we'd be willing to go through this because we love Jesus. Now, honestly, if we were honest with ourselves, we would have to conclude that we are not prepared for this. And the Bible makes it very clear that these things are literally about to take place. Are we preparing our families for this? This says, and it goes on to explain a lot of other things taking place. And, and lastly, it says, these things should awaken the anxiety of all who prize the pure, pure principles of the gospel. Now, who here prizes the pure principles of the gospel? Pure principles. You see, Satan is using these mediums, especially the papacy, in order to destroy the influence of the gospel. Mm -hmm. And this is what the real issue is, is the gospel. God is trying to, he wants to save the entire world, but Satan is distracting the minds of men, especially those of us as Seventh-day Adventists. And he's distracting us with such things as this. You know, we go to the Colosseum all the time. Don't we? We watch be people being butchered and killed all the time. Don't we? Yes. Now the reality is, is that we're not going to the Coliseum Games when we bring those Coliseum Games into our homes. Now this is something that is very popular in America. Some of us may not watch this, but these are uh, many of the things that many of us as God's people are focusing our attention on, not realizing that we're literally just reenacting what took place thousands of years ago. Now this is a man literally having his head almost as it were blown off playing a football game. Look at this man right here. Do you think that he is happy and joyous being, being knocked down like that? 
No, he's not. What about this man right here? Now, I just want to let you know that this is not uh, fake blood. This is literally real blood that's on them right now. They have been punching each other so hard in the face that blood is literally gushing out of their bodies, and people are literally paying thousands of dollars to go and watch it. Now, besides those things, we have this. Now, some of our young people will probably, probably know what this is. This is a clip from a, a recent a movie that came out last year, I believe, called Avengers Infinity War. Now, as a result of all these movies that we're watching, we're literally being conditioned to enjoy sin. Mm -hmm. To enjoy it. Now, notice this. Does anybody know what this movie is right here? This is a movie by, uh, by the name of, uh, called John Wick. Now, in this movie, this particular man, uh, played by Keanu Reeves, literally is act enacting revenge on people who killed his family or whatever may have you, and he literally goes around killing tens and tens, even hundreds of people in these movies. Now imagine, the Bible says that thou shalt not kill. Do we all agree with that? Mm -hmm. But when we watch it on television, we say that we're still keeping the commandments of God. Can you be watching sin and not be practicing it as well? You see, the way God designed our bodies is that when we behold something, it's literally processing in our minds almost as it were, as if we're doing it. Now, this was a man by the name of Kurt. Um, I forgot what his last name was, but notice what he says. It says, one of the few good things about modern times is that if you die horribly on television, you will have not died in vain, you will have entertained us. You see, this is what we want today. We want entertainment. And you know, sadly, we even come to church and want to be entertained. Yes. Instead of having the pure principles of the gospel preached and taught unto us, we want to be entertained. But do we come to church to be entertained? No. We come to be fed with the bread of life. Now, this was an article that was highlighting some principles from a movie called Gladiator that came out in 2000. Now, I want us to notice what this says. This says, it catered, talking about this particular movie, it catered to an instinct in human nature that is attracted by the suffering and bloodletting of others. So what even the world is saying is that we as human beings are naturally attracted to the suffering of other human beings. This is why the Bible says that our hearts are literally deceitful above all things and desperately wicked. Who can know it? Now, do you think that we can enter into heaven with a desperately wicked heart? We cannot. Our hearts literally have to be recreated by divine grace. Recreated. Now, this man, I forgot how to pronounce his name. He was uh, actually a French judge who lived during the 1600s. 1500s, rather, right, the 16th century. Now, notice what this man said. He said, plays, farces, spectacles, gladiators, strange beasts, metals, pictures, and other such opiates, these were for ancient peoples the bait towards slavery, the price of their li liberty, the instruments of tyranny. So what this man was saying was that all of these entertainments that really originated, especially during the time of Rome, all of these things were literally used in order to control and to bring about tyranny on the nation. Now, what we don't realize, especially living here in America, as a result of all of these distractions and entertainment and television, Satan is literally orchestrating the laws of this country in order to bring about a time of trouble such as never was. Notice this. Does anybody know what this stands for right here, that NDAA? Anybody know what this stands for? This stands for the National Defense Authorization Act. This was enacted under the auspices of President Barack Obama. Now notice this. This particular law was actually um, an addition to something called the Patriot Act. Anybody know about the Patriot Act? Enacted during 2003. Now what this is, this act literally destroys the principles of the Constitution. So what this... This literally does, we're going to read here, this says that NDA has become one of the most controversial elements of Barack Obama's uh, foreign policy. Go, it goes on to say, allow for the indefinite detention, not of um, aliens, 
but of American citizens without due process at the discretion of the president. So what this was saying is that if, if, if the government literally thinks that you are a terrorist, they have the right to lock you up without any type of trial. Now, do you think that that's something serious? That's something very, very, very serious. Notice this. By the decree enforcing the institution of the papacy in violation of the law of God, our nation will disconnect herself fully from righteousness. It says, when Protestantism shall stretch her hand across the gulf to grasp the hand of the Roman power, when she shall reach over the abyss to clasp hands with spiritualism, when under the influence of this threefold union, our country shall repudiate every principle of its constitution as a Protestant and Republican government. You see, it's a very dangerous thing not to know the inner workings of the country that you live in. Because when you don't understand these things, you can be easily manipulated. And this is what is happening to us. It says, and shall make provision for the propagation of papal falsehoods and delusions. Then we may know that the time has come for the marvelous working of Satan and that the end is near. And you know, it's amazing that sadly, when people see this, they think that the antidote for all of this corruption is to go and vote at the voting box. Maybe if we elect this politician, that he will make America great again. Maybe if we vote for this liberal uh, politician, that he will counteract the influences going on in the United States. But the person that we need to elect is Jesus Christ. You see, it is only Christ that can really remedy the problems that is going on in this country. There is no man that can solve our problems. And this is why the Bible clearly describes in Daniel chapter 2 that God is coming to set up another kingdom. You remember that story in Daniel chapter 2 when the stone cut out without hands comes and smites the image? That kingdom God is trying to set up right now in this generation. And so the question has to be asked, do we want to be a part of that kingdom? We're coming down to a close and sadly, as a result of these things going on in the world, it's had its influence upon the church. Its influence upon the church. Now, some of us may be surprised to actually know that this is actually a picture of a church. You know, we live in a day and age where you can't really tell who are really Christians anymore. You know, there was a time where you could tell when a person was a Seventh-day Adventist. But now things like this are becoming very fashionably Popular. It's popular now for ministers to get up on the pulpit and not look like ministers, but they're dressed down, they have their jeans and their boots on and everything like that. Do you know that there should be a distinction between the common and the holy? The common and the... Could, could the priest go into the sanctuary with regular clothes on? No. The priest literally had to put on special garments when they ministered for the people. Now, sadly, many of these dear young people really don't understand what they're doing, and so God is not trying to condemn them, but they need to be educated. Now, this is taken from the Huffington Post. Notice this. The world is literally about to tell us why they don't want to go to church anymore. Now, it's interesting. All of this article, a lot of this article is foolishness, but there was a point that they brought out that was very interesting. So the title is, Why Nobody Wants to Go to Church Anymore. Let's pay attention. This says, between the years 2010 and 2012, more than half of all churches in America added not one new member. Not one. Each year, nearly three million more previous churchgoers enter the ranks of the religiously unaffiliated. So this is saying that three million persons entered into the ranks of essentially non-religious people. Now, do you think that that's a good thing or a bad thing? That's a very bad thing. And I know that we know personally that we're, using, we're losing our young people in droves. But notice a point that the world brings out. So in number six, as to the reason why people, the, church, the, the world doesn't want to go to church, they said the contemporary worship experience is one of the reasons why the world does not want to go to church anymore. Notice this. This too has contributed to the decline of the church. 
it's been the trend in the last couple of decades for traditional mainline churches to pretend to be something they're not. So the world is saying is that because the church is trying to act like the world, we don't want to go to, the, go to church anymore. If the church would just follow the pure principles of the gospel, we would want to go there. But because they're trying to be like Kanye West, because they're trying to be like Jay-Z and Beyonce, we don't want any, we don't want hypocrisy. We want the truth. It says, many of them have experimented with praise bands, the installation of screens, praise music, leisure dress on the platform, and well, you know how well that has been received. And it's amazing because I used to be a drummer. And people try to convince me that these things will keep young people in the church, but I can promise you, they will keep nobody in the church. They won't keep anybody. Frankly, it has largely proven to be a fatal mistake. Now notice this. This was an article from the Sunday Times, and there was an, uh, a conversion happening to the Islamic faith, and they're about to tell us why people were converting, Christians were converting to Islam. Notice this. Some of Britain's top landowners, celebrities, and the offspring of senior establishment figures have embraced the strict tenets of the Muslim faith. The trend is being encouraged by Muslim leaders who are convinced that the conversion of prominent society figures will help to protect a community stigmatized by terrorism and fundamentalism. Notice this. This says, many, initially, uh, Bert said, he had no coherent reasons for converting, but in the longer term, I think it was overall a profund profundity, a balance and coherence and spirituality of the Muslim way in, of life in which Convinced me. So he was convinced to convert to Islam because he was attracted to the lifestyle. You know, one of the things that people are seeking to look for in us as Sunday Adventists is a difference and a superiority of lifestyle. And we have the privilege of showing them the superiority of what it's like to truly live like Jesus Christ. The faith has made inroads into the establishment. It says, now notice this, we're going to jump down to the very bottom. Many converts have been inspired by the writings of Charles Leighton, Gay Eaton, a former foreign office diplomat. Eaton, author of Islam and the Destiny of Man, said, now notice this. I have received letters from people who are put off by the wishy-washy standards of contemporary Christianity. So what this is saying is that people were converting to Islam because Christianity was wishy-washy. And they are looking for a religion which does not compromise too much with the modern world. So this is literally saying that people in the world were converting to Islam because the, because the Christian church was too closely aligned with the world. And Satan deceives us as Seventh-day Adventists, making us believe that if we come closer to the world, that this will bring more people into the church. But this is a deception. Yes. This is a deception. Let's turn our Bibles to the book. Let's turn our Bibles to the book of Matthew. Let's turn our Bibles to the book of Matthew. Let's turn to Matthew. Matthew. Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11. And we're going to start in verse 28. Matthew chapter 11. Matthew chapter 11 and verse 28. Matthew chapter 11 in verse 28. Matthew 11 in verse 28. Let's notice what the Bible says. It says, Come unto me, all ye that labor and are heavy laden, and I will give you want. So the rest that the world is looking for is not going to be found in conformity to the world, but in presenting to them Christ. He says, Take my yoke upon you and learn of me, for I am meek and proud in heart. Oh, it doesn't say that. It says, I am meek and lowly in heart, and ye shall find rest unto your souls, for my yoke is easy, and my burden is light. Let's notice this. We're coming to a close. Onward Christian shoppers. So what this is explaining 
is that as a result of the, the, the closeness of the world and the church, this has even affected economics. Notice this. The Walt Disney Company has long been a boogeyman on the religious right thanks to its uh, uh, penchant for organizing gay days at Disney World and offering benefits for same-sex couples. And so it starts to explain all of this. Now going down, it says, meanwhile, the traditional faith-based media companies have fought back. This says they are getting more business-like in the way they run their affairs. And jumping down, it says, services at megachurches don't just rival rock concerts in terms of their audiences, they also rival them in terms of their production values. Now lastly, it says, when Joyce Meyer, a Christian war horse, joined Warner Faith, for example, she more than doubled her sales. So at the end of the day, as the Bible says, the love of money is the root of all evil. Two decades ago, Christian recording artists could not get their work into mainstream outlets, such as Walmart and Tower Records. Now you can pick them up along with the latest records by Satan worshipping heavy, heavy metal bands. That surely is progress. So they're saying that it's progress that now you can find Christian alongside the satanic. But is that really progress? That's not progress. Let's notice what God says. Great controversy once again. I cannot overemphasize the importance of us reading the books that God has given to us. Because, you know, sadly, there is a, a, an antagonism against the spirit of prophecy in our church. And it amazes me that, that persons profess to be Seventh-day Adventists, but yet bash the spirit of prophecy. As if that was literally inspired by a woman. That's Jesus speaking. Amen. So let's notice what Jesus has to say to us. Conformity to, the world, to worldly customs converts the church to the world. It never converts the world to Christ. Familiarity with sin will inevitably cause it to appear less repulsive. He who chooses to associate with the servants of Satan will soon cease to fear their master. When in the way of duty we are brought into trial as was Daniel in the, in the king's court, we may be sure that God will protect us, but if we place ourselves under temptation, we shall fall sooner or later. And we come down to our very last slide. Now, this is another powerful quotation, but we're going to skip this. And at the end of the day, this is really what our issue is right here. We lack this. As a result of us really lacking the love of God is the reason why we are so conformed to the world. Let's turn our Bibles to the book of 1 John. Let's turn to 1 John. Let's turn to 1 John. 1 John chapter 5, uh, I'm sorry, 1 John chapter 2, starting in verse 15. 1 John chapter 2, starting in verse 15. 1 John 2, in verse 15, it says, Love not the world, neither the things that are in the world. If any man love the world, the love of the Father is not in him. Point blank, period. For all that is in the world, the lust of the flesh... The lust of the eyes and the pride of life is not of the Father, but is of the world. And the world passeth away, and the lust thereof, but he that doeth the will of God by forever. You see, the reason why it's such a detriment to love the things of the world is because when you love the things of the world, you adopt the principles of the world, and the principles of the world is sin. Mm -hmm. But sin can't last forever because its very nature is destruction. And so God is saying, if we want to have everlasting life, we must adopt Him and His principles. Now notice this. Now sadly, as a result of us not really loving God, we love other things. And we went through some of this already. We love such things as the Avengers and all these different things. Now it's amazing. We don't have time to go through this article. But this article was written by a woman who is now an atheist, who used to be a Christian, and she says that uh, in this movie, the main antagonist, Thanos, she's saying that Thanos is a representation of God. And I'll just make a synopsis. These movies like this are literally conditioning men, women, and children to literally hate God. 
Notice what this woman says at the end of this article. She says, that sick feeling is also why I will never become a Christian again, even if, some, even if someday I stop being an atheist. To worship someone that depraved, however benevolent he claims his unknowable logic to be, would surely be the most amoral thing I can do. So it's literally teaching people that God is an amoral being. But is God an amoral being? He's a loving being. We love things like this. Whether if it's not football, we love soccer. If it's not soccer, we love we love volleyball. If it's not volleyball, we love tennis. But we're focusing all of our attentions on things that are transitory, things that are conditioning us into the image of Satan. And lastly, the main thing that we love as human beings is this right here. I don't know if we know what this is a picture of, but this is a picture of the French Revolution. Now, during the French Revolution, there was something set up called the Goddess of Reason. You see, what we as human beings love more than anything else is our depraved reason. As a result of us loving our own way of thinking, actually, let's learn about the book of Proverbs. Let's turn to Proverbs. Let's turn to Proverbs. Let's turn to Proverbs. Let's turn to Proverbs. Proverbs chapter 3. Proverbs chapter 3. Actually, let's turn to Proverbs chapter 4. There's many verses. Proverbs chapter 4, starting verse 19. Proverbs 4 in verse 19. Proverbs 4 in verse 19. The Bible says... The way of the wicked is as what? Is as darkness. It says, they know not at what they stumble. The book of Proverbs also tells us that there's a way which seemeth right unto a man, but the end thereof are the ways of death. And so there is a remedy, there is an antidote that God gives to us. You know, let's turn our Bibles to the book of John. As we come to a close, let's turn our Bibles to the book of John. Let's turn to the book of John. John chapter 12. John chapter 12, starting in verse, starting in verse 30. John chapter 12, starting in verse 30. The Bible says, Jesus answered and said, This voice came not because of me, but for your sakes. Now is the judgment of this world. Now shall the prince of this world be cast out. Verse 32, it says, And I, if I be lifted up from the earth, will draw all men unto who? Unto me. So God is saying is that if we really want to have the love of God embedded, entrenched in our hearts, we must lift up Christ before us. And we're going to get into very detailed how we can have a close and intimate and personal relationship with our Lord and Savior. But that's going to be uh, tomorrow evening. But we're going to bring out these last passages. This is from early writings. This says, They ministers will also have a rich reward in their crowns of rejoicing. Those who are rescued by them will, and finally saved will shine as stars forever and ever. It says, And to all eternity they will enjoy the satisfaction of having done all, have, uh, having uh, done what they could in presenting the truth in its purity and beauty, so that souls fell in love with it. You know, one of the greatest burdens of any minister is to present the gospel in such a way that those who hear it will literally fall in love with it. Because the truth is literally, it comes from God. So God wants us to present the truth, and even if we're not ministers, if we're just regular church members, God wants us to present the truth to those around us so that they literally fall in love with it. Lastly, has anybody ever fallen in love before? Mm-hmm. You know, many of the, the, the principles of falling in love with the human being, it directly correlates to falling in love with God. When you're falling in love with a person, you're spending almost seemingly endless amounts of time with them. You're getting to know them. You're looking at them in the face. You're smiling. You're spending rich and cherishing time with that individual. If we're going to fall in love with Jesus, we have to do the same exact thing. How can we think that we're going to love God supremely and our neighbors as ourselves and we spend little to no time with God? 
All of these things about to break upon the earth, eternity before us, and we can barely spend ten minutes in prayer. Barely. It says, search the Bible, for it tells you of Jesus. I want you to read the Bible and see the matchless charms of Jesus. I want you to fall in love with the man of Calvary. You see, God wants us to literally fall in love with him. You know, because God has emotions. When we show him love, do you, you, that, you, that literally makes him happy. When we show him, you know, sometimes when I pray, I say, Father, I love you so much. What, what do you want to tell me this morning? We literally, we, God wants us to get to the point where we don't think about him just as some abstract being up in the sky, but as a literal friend. A literal friend. And when we have this type of friendship with God, just like the hymn says, turn your eyes upon Jesus, look full at his wonderful face, and the things of earth will grow strangely dim in the light of his glory and love. Is that the prayer of everybody tonight? Amen. Amen. Let us have a word of prayer. Dear Father in heaven, Lord, we thank you so much for the word of God presented to us. We pray in a very special way that you would give us the grace and the strength to truly, dear Father, fall in love with you. Naturally, we don't want to do the things that, that pertain to our peace. Dear Lord, and we don't want them to be hid from our eyes. And so, dear Father, I pray in a very special way that you would please touch our hearts, our minds, and lives, especially upon the Sabbath. Lord, we're praying for a revival and a reformation, especially as we seek to enter into this new year. Dear Father, you saw all the hands that are raised, that were raised, dear Lord, and I pray that you would touch each and every one of our lives. We have made decisions for time and for eternity. Lord, I pray that you will be with us as we go through this evening. Bring us out tomorrow, dear Lord, where we can hear more rich treasures of your divine word. And I pray that you would keep us to this end. In Christ's name. Amen. Amen.